In the previous video, we discussed how to initially choose a slab thickness to satisfy the surfaceability requirements of two-way slabs. In addition, we showed how to use the direct design method to find the shear and bending moments in the column and middle strips as well as the critical sections. In this video, we will show how to calculate the nominal strengths as well as calculate the required reinforcements for shear and flexure and how to detail the reinforcements. The stress strain distribution in two-way slabs in flexure is similar to one-way slab, which we discussed in detail in another video. You can find it in the link at the top or in the description below. The maximum compression strain is 0.003 and the compressive and the tensile force are equal to each other. This makes the nominal flexural strength equal to AS times FY multiplied by the distance of the force resultants from each other, where D is approximated by the slab thickness H minus 1.25 inches. For slabs with drop panels, there is a limitation on the value of D used to calculate the nominal flexural strength. The depth of the compression block A is found by equating the tensile force to the compressive force. Then it can be used to find the distance C by using the ratio of the compression block depth to C which is beta 1, which is defined in ACI chapter 22 as follows. B in two-way slabs is the width of the column middle strip or B slab. Non-pre-stressed two-way slabs should be designed as tension controlled. Thus, the net tensile strain eta T should be greater than or equal to eta T Y plus 0.003. At the end, the reduced nominal strength phi M N should be compared to M U at all sections along the span in each direction and to gamma F multiplied by MSC within B slab. The strength of two-way slabs in one-way shear rarely governs and thus no reinforcement is required and the shear strength comes from the concrete only. The one-way shear strength can be evaluated as such but limited to this maximum value. BW is the width of the plane extending across the entire slab width. Lambda S is the size effect modification factor because the strength does not increase linearly proportional to the thickness and has a maximum value of 1. The values of lambda depend on the concrete density and can be extracted from this table. Raw W is the ratio of lecturer reinforcement AS divided by BW times D. The value of F prime C used to calculate the shear strength is limited to 10,000 PSI. The strength can then be checked against the available loads using the following term where an additional term is added to minimize the likelihood of diagonal compression failure and limit cracking. The strength of two-way slabs in two-way shear without reinforcement must be satisfied at the critical sections we defined in the previous video. The stress corresponding to the nominal two-way shear strength provided by the concrete V sub C is the least of the following values. The lambdas are determined as previously shown for one-way shear. Beta is the ratio of the long to the short dimensions of the rectangular column. Alpha S is 40 for interior columns, 30 for edge columns and 20 for corner columns. B0 is the perimeter of the critical section. The strength of two-way slabs in two-way shear with reinforcement must be satisfied and is determined according to the following table. Lambda S is allowed to be taken as 1 if stirrups are provided and detailed according to the following rules. And if headed shear studs were provided, 
as a means of reinforcement, the following detailing requirements shall be met instead. This also requires that the following condition is met for both, where AV is the total area of stirrup legs or headed shear studs on one peripheral line geometrically similar to the perimeter of the column section within the spacing S. The shear strength of two-way slabs can be increased by providing shear reinforcement consisting of properly anchored single or multiple legged stirrups. Stirrups are permitted to be used provided that D is greater than or equal to 6 inches or 16 times the diameter of the stirrup. To calculate the extra shear strength gained by the steel reinforcement, we use the following equation. Headed shear studs are typically welded to flat rails. The assembly is then positioned on chairs around the columns and subsequently nailed to the formwork. The size and spacing of the studs and the length of the rail depend on the shear requirements. Like bars, sufficient cover and spacing requirements must be provided for shear studs. The strength of the studs in shear can be found using the same equation as that for the stirrups. Following the definition of AV in the previous example, we draw a peripheral line geometrically similar to the column and count the number of studs intersecting the line, in this case 8. Then, multiply the number of studs by the cross-sectional area of a single stud to get AV. The following equation must also be satisfied when using shear studs. The following table summarizes the shear strength for two-way shear in two-way slabs with and without reinforcement. These nominal strengths should be multiplied by the reduction factor for shear phi equal to 0.75 before being compared to the factored applied loads VU. The required flexural reinforcement at a critical section in a column or middle strip in a two-way slab can be found using the following equation, where R sub n and phi are the following. The factored bending moments MU can be obtained from the direct design method described in the previous video. You can find the link to the video in the description below. The area of the flexural reinforcement at any critical section cannot be less than 0.0018 times the gross cross-sectional area. The required flexural reinforcement in the slab width B slab can also be determined as follows. In this equation, phi is 0.75 for shear. And VUV is the factored shear stress on the critical section for two-way action from the controlling load combination. At critical sections, the maximum allowed flexural reinforcement area is limited by the following to ensure the section is tension controlled. B here is the width of the column or middle strip. If the calculated required reinforcement area exceeds the maximum allowed, the thickness of the slab H should be increased such that the slab becomes tension controlled. A similar check should be done for reinforcement within B slab where B here is B slab. Prior to determining the required size and spacing of the stirrups required for shear reinforcement, the following condition should be verified. If it isn't, the thickness of the slab should be increased. The total number of stirrup legs provided in one peripheral line depend on the number of sides of the critical section. The following equation can be used to determine the required spacing. Stirrups can be terminated wherever the design strength of the concrete alone without reinforcement can handle the factored loads. This happens whenever this condition is met. Similarly, prior to determining the required size and spacing of the shear studs, the following condition should be verified. If it isn't, the thickness of the slab should be increased. 
The total number of studs provided in one peripheral line depend on the number of sides of the critical section and the spacing requirements parallel to the column face. The following equation can be used to determine the required spacing. Studs can be terminated wherever the design strength of the concrete alone without reinforcement can handle the factored loads. This happens whenever this condition is met. The minimum yield strength of the shear studs required according to ACI is 51,000 PSI. The following minimum and maximum spacing requirements as well as the minimum cover of reinforcements should be met. Where DAGG is the nominal maximum aggregate size used in the concrete mixture. Whenever a corner slab is supported by stiff elements such as walls or edge beams with alpha F greater than 1 as defined in the previous video, corner reinforcement must be provided because there will be higher bending moments in those regions. Corner reinforcement must be provided at the top as well as the bottom of the slab and should be designed to resist the maximum positive factored moment in this slab panel per unit width. The reinforcement can be placed diagonally or parallel to the edges as shown with a distance of LA over 5 from the corner, with LA being the longer side of the panel. The top and bottom flexural reinforcement of two-way slabs should be properly terminated at the ends. The bottom reinforcement must extend at least 6 inches into the supporting member. The top reinforcement must achieve the required development length. To know how to determine the required development lengths, refer to the video about design of reinforced concrete beams at the top corner or in the description below. The minimum bar lengths and continuity requirements for two-way slabs without beams are shown and summarized in the following diagram. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.